A big thanks to Dashlane for making this exploration possible. Keep your online accounts and passwords secure with dashlane.com slash the exploration and get 10% off your first year of premium. You're in China and you want to circumvent the internet firewall. As you browse the web from site to site, you constantly encounter websites the government doesn't want you to see. YouTube, blocked. Twitter, blocked. Google, blocked. Wikipedia, blocked. Facebook, blocked. The government doesn't want its citizens using these sites. If they did, democracy would be just around the corner. A quick Google search for Tank Man at Tiananmen Square would reveal the oppression of the regime. Thousands would be in the streets protesting the government to demand their human rights. But for now, the population of China is trapped behind an impenetrable firewall of internet censorship and spying. And like with the physical wall of China in days of old, the Great Firewall of China is almost impossible to get around. But wait, there's already a commenter who's posted below, I'm watching this on YouTube in China, lol. As it turns out, my portrayal of internet use in China, prevalent in Western media, is kind of wrong. To access YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, any block site in China, one need only pay a few dollars a month for a VPN, a virtual private network, which can hide your IP address and location, and done. Government censors evaded. Read about any banned topic. Follow me on Twitter at William C. Fox and send me Chinese government banned words to your heart's content. Please don't do that. So why do we have this image in our minds of China's internet as censored and controlled by some big brother type figure just waiting to throw you in prison for googling democracy? What is the Great Firewall of China if you can just hop it like a great Chinese fence? The answer leads us to a place perhaps more insidious. How do you control the internet without giving the impression to the average citizen that you're doing so? The Tiananmen Square protests weren't just a political awakening for the student protesters. It was an awakening for the Communist Party of China, which since the death of Chairman Mao had been implementing changes into Chinese society some saw as opening a Pandora's box of civil unrest. During Mao's Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, he and his allies within the Communist Party possessed near full control of the media. The existing propaganda department was shut down and replaced with something more sympathetic to Mao's policies. Newspaper, radio, and bulletin boards were used to broadcast the messages of the party, mobilizing thousands to wave Mao's book of quotations and re-educate so-called reactionary elements of the party. Even fine arts like opera and film were meant to reinforce the presence of the state in citizens' private lives. But after Mao's death in 1976, new Chinese leadership began a process of reforms, opening up China without getting rid of the Communist Party. De-Maoization, as it was called, included a slow move towards a market economy, some private ownership of farms, and critical to our story, limited commercialization of the media. As a means of legitimizing central party control, media investigations of local governments were allowed. The 80s saw reform central propaganda department, which oversaw a freer exchange of ideas in society. But there was disagreement within the party between those who thought economic reforms went too far and wanted homogenous public opinion, and those who wanted the economy slowly liberalized and some free expression allowed. The only thing these two corners of the party could agree on was that loud outbursts of dissent needed to be put down. And that is exactly what happened when student protests in Tiananmen Square in April of 1989 spread to other Chinese cities. The world was watching when the protests were violently suppressed. For hardliners inside the party, it was evidence that the government had been too soft, that the laxness on speech over the years since Mao's death was damaging their cause. A suppression of the media followed. But it must be said that this suppression never reached anywhere near the level as during the Cultural Revolution, and focused a lot of energy on opinion influencers, an attempt to stop community action by stopping the people who organize it. Like a tea kettle, the government learned to maintain control, it needed to find some form of a middle ground between unforgiving censorship of all political dissent and complete openness, lest society boil over. This would prove a valuable lesson when revolutionary technology would arrive just a few years later. In the early 90s, economic growth remained the top priority of the Chinese Communist Party. And so it was logical when the internet came to China in 1994 that this driver of the economic future would be embraced by government and spread across the country. 15 years later, in 2009, over a quarter of Chinese citizens used the internet. Today it's over 800 million people, close to 60% of the country. That's more than double the entire US population. 
But the World Wide Web came to China with strings attached. The Central Party immediately issued regulations on the new technology. Such regulation included the ominous and expansive detail that the internet couldn't be used to harm the security and interests of the state. And so between 1994 and now, a massive state apparatus for control of the internet has emerged. The original operation for controlling the internet was through the Ministry of Public Security and was called the Golden Shield Project. But it's better known today as the Great Firewall of China. The party controls the Chinese internet through site blocking, topic filtering, rearranging search results, mass surveillance of web traffic, and self-censorship imposed on private companies. First and foremost, the Chinese government simply blocks websites. We've already gone through some of them, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, Wikipedia. Part of the reason is that these sites won't self-censor content. Well, Google might be caving on that, but that's a topic for another time. Another reason for blocking sites is because for each of the examples I mentioned, a domestic Chinese copycat site is available. Baidu for search, Weibo for friends, Taobao for shopping, or Yuku for video. And as domestic sites, each of these alternatives will better serve the government's interest and the Chinese economy at large. For the second method of control, the party filters words and topics of conversation. For the average Chinese citizen scrolling through their feed on Weibo, equivalent to Twitter, posts they make or comments they leave may be automatically filtered for review. Discussing the June 4th events at Tiananmen Square or notable activists associated with them will likely be filtered. Discussing the American government-funded media organization Voice of America, filtered. After constitutional changes allowing Xi Jinping to stay in office without term limits, words and phrases like emperor, control, 1984, animal farm, and brave new world were banned. And yes, any comparisons between Xi and Winnie the Pooh were banned too. The actual legwork for reviewing these filtered posts is done by millions of online censors. At least two million, according to official sources. Some of these are government workers, but a lot of the work is also done by private firms, which are obliged to hire censors as part of establishing themselves in the Chinese market. Depending on size, each website hires up to a thousand censors to review posts, enforce party mandates on newly banned words, and often to simply browse for suspicious material. But again, we encounter a gray area here, because while the government is fairly strict on certain terms and topics, generally speaking, dissent is allowed on the Chinese internet. You can complain about the government, even in aggressive fashion. But what you can't do is try to mobilize your community to action based on those complaints. A fascinating research article, which I've cited in the description, conducted a large-scale experiment to study this phenomenon. The researchers found Chinese people can write the most vitriolic blog posts about even the top Chinese leaders without fear of censorship. But if they write in support of or opposition to an ongoing protest, or even about a rally in favor of a popular policy or leader, they will be censored. It seems part of the lesson learned after Tiananmen Square, the lesson about finding a middle ground to maintain control, was to let people voice opinions, but not to let them congregate based on those opinions. So why let people sound off at all? Well, another aspect of internet control in China is mass surveillance. A lot of this surveillance is aimed at influencers and thought leaders like journalists and writers, but by law, the browsing activity of all internet users is gathered by internet service providers and passed along to the government. And yeah, this can naturally mean suppression of dissidents with a crowd behind them, but it also means in a twisted way that the government can better know what its population wants, and even use concentrated complaints about officials to make staffing decisions in local offices. But I don't want to mince words here. What about isms on America aside, in my opinion, this is dystopian stuff. The researchers I mentioned before called the Great Firewall the largest selective suppression of human communication in the recorded history of any country. And the suppression seems to be intensifying. In 2013, Xi Jinping spearheaded a new committee called the Central Cyberspace Affairs Commission to oversee and guide the government bureaucracy managing the internet. Naturally, he made himself the chairman. Along with eliminating term limits in 2018, this move has placed Xi in position to mold China's internet for the foreseeable future. Crackdowns on VPNs have been widely reported in the media, including the imprisonment of a software developer accused of operating a VPN to circumvent government blocks. But despite the crackdown, use of VPNs continues to be widespread. Part of the reason this is still somewhat tolerated is business-related. Technology companies rely on VPNs in order to access things like GitHub, and the continued growth of the Chinese economy demands open access to the World Wide Web, not just a China Wide Web. The government knows this and is therefore hamstrung from completely eliminating VPN use, at least for now. 
And the Communist Party isn't in a huge rush. That's because they've learned another, more insidious lesson about the nature of information exchange. In her book, Censored, Distraction and Diversion Inside China's Great Firewall, Margaret E. Roberts describes three methods the party uses to control the internet. The first is fear. This is when the government uses punishments or threats of punishment to stop certain stories or comments from being posted. These tactics, like the repression in the Maoist era, are immediately effective but come with drawbacks. People are more likely to negatively respond to strongman efforts to censor them and will actively seek out information if they sense that the government is sensitive about it being seen. So outright suppression like this is usually reserved for leaders, protesters, or pesky journalists. More commonly used are two other tactics, what Roberts calls flooding and friction. Flooding refers to efforts of the government to drown out critical thought in a sea of pro-government messages, or sometimes just general confusion. News embarrassing to the regime is subject to a deluge of confusing and contradictory pro-government articles and comments. The hope is that the average citizen won't take the time to figure it all out, and just assume the waters are too muddied to know the truth. Westerners will recognize these tactics from their use in Russia's ongoing cyber warfare efforts on US social media sites like Twitter and Facebook. Since 2004, a so-called 50 cent party has operated in China. It's a group of students paid per post they make on behalf of the government. The goal of these flooding efforts is not to convince everyone, but rather to frustrate people, make them give up trying to find the right answer in an ocean of contradiction. And this dynamic is also critical for the third and most unsettling tactic, friction. Roberts defines friction as increasing the cost, either in time or money, of access or spread of information. In other words, rather than simply banning a website with unflattering information about the Communist Party, just make it a little slower to load. Rather than arresting the organizers of a protest, just make the messenger app WeChat lag in the areas you expect a gathering. Ban some websites like Twitter and Wikipedia, with the full knowledge that yes, some dedicated people will jump the firewall with a VPN, but most won't. These methods rely on a darker part of human nature, our impatience. The weight of evidence shows that when it comes to internet content, people simply won't wait. Look at the example of Google in 2010. During a disagreement with the Chinese government, Google refused to manipulate search results as instructed. As a result, the government directed ISPs to reject a quarter of Google's traffic. To be clear, the instructions weren't to reject all traffic to Google, just some. Nonetheless, Chinese users simply stopped using Google. Usage numbers crashed over three years. Their market share in China went from around 40% to under 2%. The mere sight of a loading bar had driven consumers to domestic Chinese search engines. Yes, Google was formally banned three years later, but it was already inconsequential by then. Sure, you say, these tactics work on some, but dedicated, politically engaged citizens will make the effort to circumvent the censor. Wait for the page to load. Call their friend when Messenger is down to ask if the protest was rescheduled. But the trick to this is that the average citizen won't. They'll just use the government approved sites, hit the back button if a link loads slow, or stay home rather than try to find a demonstration. The average citizen won't notice if 9 of the top 10 search results for Tiananmen Square have disappeared or been moved to page 4. They'll just click the first result on page 1 like everyone does. The government doesn't just hope, it knows a significant portion of people with busy lives and limited time will just give up, or even more likely, fail to notice the manipulation at all. If you're flipping through the dictionary, and no word appears between disseminal and decipiment, is it because the government censor made it so? What word were you looking for again? When people don't feel the weight of government censorship, they don't act. As internet use skyrockets, as more and more Chinese citizens are spending their days on smartphones, the government is playing a large role in how that internet is laid out. Entertainment to the top, descent to the bottom. And by using subtle manipulation over heavy handedness, they'll weave reality for over a billion people. With the world's internet becoming ever more divided, it's easy to sit back and relax about our own. But is our situation really so simple? With spying, security breaches, deep hacks, net neutrality rules, internet algorithms messing with our emotions, juggling 115 unique character passwords and uppercase, lowercase, and don't use your real name in the password or don't use your birthday in the password because you'll definitely get hacked and the internet can be a lot. But I've got a tool that's helping with some of that. Dashlane. 
Dashlane is one of the smartest ways to manage your digital identity and information. It keeps all your usernames and passwords for you and autofills them onto websites and apps. It also has an identity dashboard where you can see your password health as well as any breach alerts or accounts that may be compromised by hackers. Dashlane even includes a one-click VPN for all your devices. Seriously, trying to balance grad school, working, making content, my life can be really convoluted. And Dashlane offers a way for me to get back a little control and peace of mind. Dashlane is the easiest way to protect yourself from corporate data breaches, personal account hacks, and sophisticated phishing scams. Dashlane has patented security architecture, encrypting everything so that no one except you can see your information. And with the recent Facebook breach, nearly 50 million accounts compromised, added security is more important than ever. The aspect of Dashlane that works best for me is its universality. In my household, don't judge, we're using Android and Apple phones, Windows computers, and iPads. But that doesn't stop Dashlane, which lets you use your passwords and their security across all your devices and operating systems. It's super quick to download their software or app and get going, wherever you are and whatever you're using. Dashlane has already saved me several password-induced headaches since I started using it, so I'm excited to offer it to you today. Dashlane is free for life, but all viewers who use the link in the description get access to Dashlane Premium free for 30 days. In addition, if you use the promo code EXPLORATION, you'll get 10% off Dashlane Premium. So head on over to dashlane.com slash the exploration by following the link in the description and try Dashlane today. Later guys.